Hello there lads, just quickly before we get started today, this is part 2 of the Modern Tanks video where we're going to discuss BRs of 11.3 and 11.7 with truly modern tanks. If you haven't seen the previous part 1 where we discussed additions and battle ratings of 10.7 and 11.0, I highly recommend you go watch that first because otherwise you may be just a wee bit confused. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, let's get started. Now here we start to get really high, a battle rating of 11.3 in the game will mean that the current 10.0s will go back to getting primarily down tiered the way they are currently, as everything above them will have to be up tiered to fill this spot in the matchmaker. BR 11.3 will see some truly modern main battle tanks and we're starting out with the M1A2 Abrams. This is the 1992 variant of the Abrams produced just after the Gulf Wars and its main upgrades over the M1A1 heavy variants are computer systems and interior technologies such as fire control systems, thermal viewers and the Hunter Killer technology that won't be seen in War Thunder. However, the M1A2 will offer some noticeable improvements over the BR 11.0 M1A1 HA that definitely need to be pointed out that make it worth being a separate tank, even if just being an M1A2 wasn't worthy of that already. So lads, while the M1A1 HA uses first generation depleted uranium armour plating, the M1A2, like the M1A1 HC, which you'll notice I haven't included in this video, uses second gen DU armour. Now, what you may be surprised to hear is that the second generation DU does not actually increase the armor's effectiveness over the first generation DU over the M1A1 HA. See, what happens in real life is that the more shots a section of armor takes, the less effective that armor becomes. If a tank has 100mm of armor, say, and you have 90mm of penetration, you won't penetrate it on the first shot, probably won't penetrate it on the second, but you may penetrate it on the third or fourth try, because the armor loses its integrity the more shots slam into it. This remains true even for the composite armour on the M1A1 Heavy variant with its depleted uranium inserts, and what the second generation plating aims to do is increase the integrity of the armour, thus increasing its reliability and its ability to maintain its effectiveness even after absorbing several incoming rounds. Just a little bit here I'm editing in from the future, I just realised that the second generation DU might prove more effective against the multi-core 3BM42 Mango, which I mentioned might be able to penetrate the M1A1 HA but probably would not penetrate the M1A2. This is just a guess, however. So the M1A2 retains the exact same armor stats of the M1A1 HA, at least in onboard armor. Hold that thought though, because we're going to come back to this in a bit. The gun on the M1A2 is the same M256 on the previous Abrams variant, but on this tank, it would get a new shell. That means M829A1, the silver bullet, becomes the stock shell. And honestly, how cool is it that we're talking about Gulf War DU shells like this as stock rounds? Just two years ago, the idea of an Abrams tank in War Thunder at all was complete nonsense. I even made a video saying that when I just started out with this channel. The M829A2 is a noticeable improvement over the A1, with identical penetration statistics as the German DM43. This is very easy to see as the rounds were developed at about the same time and fired out of very similar guns, although once again, the M256 is not exactly the same as the L44. They can fire the same shells though. Given the amount of collaboration between the Americans and Germans as far as military technology goes at the time, it's easy to see how they ended up with rounds that basically have identical effectiveness. Oh, by the way, I am not saying that the rounds are identical in the way they're made, they do not look the same, they're not the same round, it's not a licensed produced round, they just have the same penetration statistics. For a refresher, that's 615mm flat and 360mm at 60 degrees. This makes sense as the Abrams balancing factor has always been that it has comparatively low penetration compared to contemporaries at its tier, but hold on, we're not quite done yet. The M829A2 shell has an uncharacteristically high muzzle velocity for this gun and these shells, the highest muzzle velocity of any shell fired by the Abrams, including the modern upgrades of the M829 shell. The A2 has what's called a stepped tip, and this plus its high muzzle velocity makes it better than DM43 at destroying the heavy ERA of Russian main battle tanks, meaning that it could likely penetrate and kill the Contact 5 equipped Russian MBTs from close enough range, even through their heavy ERA protection. The M1A2 increases weight over the M1A1 heavy variant by enough that the top speed is now only 65 kph, although the use of the familiar 1500 horsepower gas turbine engine and advanced transmission will make it noticeably more mobile than the T90A, despite having only a 5 kph top speed advantage. Now back to the M1A2's armour for a second. I mentioned how it offered no improvement over the M1A1 heavy. Well, here's where add-on modules save us. The M1A2 in War Thunder should see the Tusk equipment, standing for Tank Urban Survival Kit has an upgrade module at maybe tier 3, 
which would offer up some increased protection, although mainly against chemical munitions. Now, I know that the Tusk equipment could be fitted to the M1A1 as well, but for the sake of making the M1A2 more special and unique, I propose withholding that upgrade until this model of the Abrams. Now, the tank urban survival kit on the Abrams adds a substantial amount of explosive reactive armor to the side hull and turret of the tank to protect from predominantly RPGs, as well as some slat armor, but also raises the number of smoke grenade discharges from 12 to a whopping 32. The tank commander's 50 caliber machine gun and loaded 7.62mm also got transparent shields, not that this would make any difference in War Thunder, and unfortunately no additional armor is fitted to the front of the tank. The last part of the Tusk equipment is a second 50 caliber machine gun which is remotely controlled and sits above the main gun. The purpose of this is for close range anti-infantry use without the commander or loader having to expose themselves to enemy small arms fire, but in War Thunder it would be useful against SPAGs, allowing them to be very easily killed from the side with MGs only. Helpful as I can see Gaijin making shell costs at this tier something like 2000 SL each. Next up is a modern beast from the east, the T-72B3 of 2010. Once again, this is the familiar T-72B, but rather than Contact 1 or Contact 5, this tank mounts the relic heavy explosive reactive armor. It also features a new 1130 horsepower engine, giving it a much improved power to weight ratio of around 23 horsepower per ton. Very nice, although I believe the top speed is still the same, 60 kph. The armor counting the Relic DRA is going to be up at around 950mm kinetic effectiveness on the turret and 850mm on the hull, with likely in the neighborhood of 1500mm of chemical protection, and what's more, tandem shape charge warheads aren't going to get through this stuff either. Basically think, anywhere there's ERA, this tank will be impenetrable to the first shot. There are plenty of chinks between this tank's relic armor however, so at close range it will be an easy tank to penetrate at this tier. The firepower of the T-72B3 will be significant, to say the least. Utilizing the modern 2A46M5 gun, the T-72B should see the T-90A's 3BM46 Swinitz shell as its stock shell. The new upgraded shell will be the 3BM60 Swinitz 2, which it can carry thanks to a new autoloader, which also has more protection. The Swinitz 2 shell has around 700mm penetration against composite armor at point blank range, although I cannot stress enough that this is a rough estimate, and pretty much everything at this tier is a rough estimate, especially for the Russians. It will also gain the T90A's reflex anti-tank missile, but see a further improved heat FS shell, the 3BK31M. This is a very modern shell. It's a heat FS shell with a depleted uranium lining. Information on the shell is extremely sparse, but it should achieve roughly 750 millimeters penetration, give or take. There are plenty of additional minor upgrades, most of which concern systems that we don't see in War Thunder, but the T-72B3 is primarily a continuation of the T-72 and T-90 line, with a familiar tank being upgraded to compete with a new era of opponents, and it's a signature Russian MBT, well respected to this day for its rugged reliability. Like at most BRs, the Russians are going to get another friend at this tier, the T-80 BVM of the year... 2017. <laughs> Most modern tank in War Thunder right here. When April Fools released the T-90A to us, this tank was being unveiled. And now it could legitimately be added into the game. Just... Oh my god. So the T-80 BVM is very similar in premise to the T-72B3, an upgrade to a now outdated tank at the T-80 BV. This vehicle once again mounts the relic ERA all over the front of the hull and turret and cage armor as well. This tank uses the 2A46M4 gun and would have the exact same ammunition choices as the T-72B3, as this tank also has a new auto loader allowing it to carry more modern shells like Swinitz 2. It features a new 1250 horsepower engine which should allow it to retain the same top speed as its predecessor the T-80U despite its extra weight. It should be noted that the coverage of the relic ERA on the T-80 BVM is more extensive than that of the T-72B3, although the underlying armor will be slightly worse, meaning that the M829A2 shell on the M1A2 Abrams could penetrate it from slightly further away likely up to 500 meters, although this is a complete guess. The T-80 BVM is a very modern tank, capable of replacing all variants of the T-80 currently in service, and should provide Russia with a fantastic tank for 11.3, although in an up tier even further, it will be made pretty much redundant, but we'll get to that a bit later. God, this video is a long one. 
Here's a pleasant surprise at this tier, the Challenger 2 Mark II. Now, this is not a production series tank, not yet at least, and I did mention this vehicle in the Challenger 2 dev blog just this last weekend. So recently, Ryan Mattal purchased a majority stake in BAE Systems Land Division, and in doing so, put forth a technology demonstrator for a Challenger 2 Mark II, part of the Challenger 2 Life Extension program. This upgrade to the Challenger 2 would feature a new welded turret and it houses the Ryan Mattel L55 gun found on the Leopard 2A6 and 2A7. Because of this, it is likely to fire the DM-53 shell, which, out of this gun, which is substantially longer than the L-44 gun on the Leopard 2A5 and its predecessors, should achieve roughly 650 to 680 millimeters flat penetration. This is a bit of speculation, however. We're also talking almost 400 millimeters at 60 degrees. This is one bloody powerful shell. The tank is still a Challenger 2, however, with roughly 550 millimeters of turret armor versus kinetic energy munitions. We've been through this, so certainly not the most effective armor and although the tank is given a new 1500 horsepower engine, it's still a comparatively slow tank with little effective armor. Think if the Russian tanks just got new shells without new ERA. The Challenger 2 Mark II would be a bit of a glass cannon, but without the speed of an Abrams or a Leopard 2, so I think 11.3 would be rather balanced for it, despite having greater firepower than tanks at 11.7, as this is really all it has to its name. Not gonna lie, I would be very proud of Britain having the most penetration for any shell in the game. And that's all for 11.3. Two NATO tanks, one American, one British, and two Russians. There's absolutely no chance we can have this be the end of the game for even a single patch, as Germany would still be lacking. However, there really is nothing any other nation like Japan or Italy could get at this tier. So what I think should happen is that at this tier, we need the ability for Britain and America to fight against each other. I've been advocating for this for a good long while, actually, similarly to how we have Britain versus America in RRB. And given that every other nation can fight with or against against any other at top tier, the UK versus the USA would help to even out the teams. What I more suspect happening though is that the 11.7s I'm about to propose will be added in first, probably at 11.3 to begin with, be the absolute top of the tech tree, and then a patch later these vehicles will fill the gap in between, while the following tanks would be up tier to 11.7. This is where War Thunder will end. This is it, end of the line. 11.7 will see the most advanced MBTs built by the nations that sit at this tier, which will be limited to America, Germany, and Russia. To start things off, let's talk about the M1A2 SEP V2. The system enhancement package for the M1A2 improves a lot of onboard systems, which we won't see in War Thunder, but it does provide a noticeable improvement over the preceding M1A2. It also looks different due to the remotely controlled commander's machine gun, which is part of this vehicle's Tusk package. The M1A2 SEP V2 most importantly uses third generation depleted uranium armor, and unlike second generation, versus first gen, this third gen will offer up a bit of additional protection over the base M1A2 with second gen. Roughly 50 millimeters added to the turret's effectiveness, although this really is quite a guess, so potentially as much as 100 millimeters additional effectiveness, though this much is probably unlikely. The rest of the tank's armor is the same, although I'm not certain as to whether the third gen DU will increase the chemical protection of the M1A2 SEP over the base A2. It's possible, at the very least, it will be equal, but potentially it'll go up another 100 millimeters. The Tusk package for the SEP V2 variant of the M1A2 includes new ERA, which gives the tank a signature look, as well as that insanely tall remotely operated Commander's 50 cal. Besides those differences, the Tusk equipment for the set will be the same as the base A2, so additional smoke grenades and some slat armor that will be of zero use to us in War Thunder because there are no Taliban soldiers running around with RPG-7s. Besides the additional effectiveness of the DU armor plating in the turret, the set V2 will also be an improvement over the base M1A2 in firepower. This variant should fire the M829A3 depleted uranium ABFSDS shell. This shell is quite powerful. And this is the one time I'll say that shell costs should be very high, as for the tank to be using this all the time would be a very bad thing. Funnily enough though, when facing the Germans, you'll actually want to use M829A2 instead. M829A3 is an extremely long penetrator, over 75 centimeters long, with a large, heavy steel disposable tip. What this does is it allows the M829A3 to basically ignore heavy ERA like Contact 5 and even Relict, so as I said, you want to discourage the use of this as much as possible, and only allow it to be used when absolutely necessary. This round could penetrate straight through those T72B3s and T80BVMs, even at a good 2.5km range. Against regular old armor, however, M829A2 actually has more penetration due to its leaning on brute force with that higher velocity, and the step tip allows it to penetrate better at angles. The M829A3 against 
regular armor is only a very slight improvement over M829A1, and against RHA, it's actually likely to be slightly worse. Although, once again, this is just an educated speculation. With increased firepower and armor over the M1A2, although slightly increased weight, meaning a couple kph down in top speed, especially with that Tusk package, the M1A2 SEP V2 will round off America's tank tech tree with a powerful and iconic tank that is likely to still be in use for decades to come. Finally, we arrive back at Germany with the Leopard 2A5, one of the most beautiful fighting vehicles ever designed, at least in my opinion. Although I know some of you like the boxy Leopard 2s more. I know, I know, it's all the way up here, even though it's only a 1995 vehicle, but here's why. The Leopard 2A5 will have a physically impenetrable turret. That's it, right there completely impenetrable by any shell in game anywhere across the frontal turret. If this thing is hauled down, just bail out. Your day is done, my friend. In all seriousness, the effectiveness of the Leopard 2A5's turret is a whopping 850mm against kinetic energy munitions and a ridiculously high 1750mm versus chemical. Good luck. <laughs> I've talked about why this is in a recent video in collaboration with Maximus, so if you want to go check that out, there'll be a card on screen and link in the description. The hull of the Leopard 2A5 is the same C-Tech hull from the Leopard 2A4 at BR 10.7, and with the arrowhead turret piece only adding half a ton's weight, the mobility of the Leopard 2A5 should not suffer noticeably over the 2A4. Like the M1A2 SEP V2, the Leopard 2A5 is an increase in both armour and firepower. This tank will fire the DM-53 shell, which on the Challenger 2 Mark II will be the highest penetrating NATO shell in the game, but don't worry German fans, this one won't exactly suffer. 640mm flat penetration on this baby, and a tad bit of angled penetration, 375mm at 60 degrees. Wow. Something I didn't mention when talking about the Rheinmetall CR2 is that this shell is also what's called a segmented penetrator, which helps it deal with Russian heavy ERA like Relict. In this fashion, it too will be capable of penetrating any Russian tank, even with its ERA, out to a very long range. This shell will be the best in the game, and with the Leopard 2A5 having such an insanely strong turret and high mobility superior to that of the M1A2 SEP V2, especially with the Tusk equipped, and likely the highest at this tier, it'll be one of the most versatile and effective tanks in the the entire game, capable of penetrating everything and defending against anything. The stock shell with the Leopard 2A5 is going to be a point of content, with it either having the DM33, a shell seen a full 1.0 BR ago and really surpassed since then, or DM43, which Germany themselves never actually used. Other nations use DM43, we've covered that enough today, but Germany did not. So please leave your thoughts in the comments, what should the Leopard 2A5 have as its stock shell at this tier? Either way, this is, like the M1A2, one of the most iconic main battle tanks ever designed and would round off Germany's tank tech tree well. If you're wondering about the Leopard 2A6 and Leopard 2A7, well, the 2A6 would be identical to the 2A5 but with even more firepower, which would not be good for the game as it would low pin everything anywhere from any angle and any range. The Leopard 2A5 is already going to be an insane level of firepower. The Leopard 2A6 does nothing but improve upon that. So I'm going to say no thank you. The Leopard 2A7, on the other hand, would improve the firepower even more with the DM63 shell up around 720 to 750 millimeters flat penetration and have an improved turret and hull armor enough that even the hull could stop M829A3. I'm going to say a definite never to this. There is nothing that could be added to counter these tanks. The game would just be an armorless slaughter fest, and that's just not what balance is. No, I think the Leopard 2A5 is definitely powerful enough to contend with the best any other nation has to offer, at least in a War Thunder sense, despite the fact that the M1A2 SEP V2 and the next tank I'm about to bring up would likely outperform it in real life due to other factors like active protection systems, onboard computer systems, fire control, and other equipment. What is the next tank, you ask? Well, the T-90M. Last tank for the video, you hear me lads? This is it. We're done. Developed at the same time as the T-80 BVM in 2017, and first adopted last year in 2018, and therefore tying with its top spot for the most modern MBT in War Thunder, the T-90M is one seriously powerful machine. The best Russia has to offer in every way. Yes, T-14, I hear you. But no, not in War Thunder at least. 
No, this will certainly be the top Russian tank and easily earns the top spot at 11.7 following the T-72B3. Like the T-72B3 and T-80BVM, the T-90M replaces the Contact 5 on the T-90A with Relict Heavy ERA, but unlike those two previous tanks, the T-90M also upgrades the existing base tank in many ways. First thing I'll say is that its armament is the exact same as those two other tanks, so we don't have to cover that. The armor is far more extensive than either of those two, with better coverage on the Relict plates as well as side armor that actually has a good chance of stopping tank shells from lower tier opponents. With heavy ERA on the side of the turret and thick side skirts made up of armored reinforced rubber sandwiched between steel plates. Actually, I should have mentioned this specifically before, but most of the Russian tanks at 10.7 and above have a good side turret protection, but this tank is the only one that will feature decent protection on the side of the hull. The IR Dazzlers has been removed, their functionality more integrated into the turret, as Dazzlers don't generally work against latest generation ATGMs anyway, this allowed for better coverage with the ERA. Also, finally making an appearance on a Russian tank, blowout ammo racks. This is what gives the T-90M's turret its signature shape, as the rear section of the turret houses an additional ammunition rack for ammo that didn't fit in the autoloader, although I suspect that most players in War Thunder aren't going to be bringing out enough ammunition to really see the use of this. This is a sick looking, almost alien looking tank that will surely compete with the best of NATO, and given its decent side protection and therefore a slight penchant for angling actually working here, this tank will be a fun one to play and certainly one to watch out for. Well lads, that is... Phew, that is it for this video. My god, this is without a doubt the longest video I've ever attempted. I doubt I'll do another big one like this again for a very long time. Actually, I might split this video in two, I haven't quite decided yet. We'll see how things turn out in editing. This is where I honestly believe the end of the game will be. These three super advanced main battle tanks, and as far as the entire proposed tech tree goes, my opinions given the values I know, which I believe to be perhaps not accurate, but likely as accurate as Gaijin will be able to get, I believe these proposed tech trees to be balanced. Please let me know your thoughts on all of this. If you think anything should be rebalanced, please let me know in the comments. As I often say, if you want to discuss a specific point I made in this video, please do leave a timestamp in your comments so that I can skip back and work out exactly what we're discussing easily. If I got any information in this video wrong, then I do strongly apologize for that and I'd love for you to let me know as I'm always eager to learn more and correct any mistakes I may make. As I said in the beginning of this video, however, please do be sure to leave links or references to sources that I can check them out and ask around. I really hope you lads have enjoyed this video as it's taken me a ton of time, actually around 70 hours of work went into the creation of this video. With that in mind, it would mean the world to me if you would leave a like on this video, share it around with friends on social media, forums, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Remember to hit that bell icon, join the 360 squad, and come follow me on Twitch and Twitter and such at the links in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support my channel further, then there's a link in the description to my Patreon, where backers get access to unique tiered rewards such as privileges on the koala tree, my Discord server, credits and videos, and even get an invitation to join Dion Albanach, my War Thunder Squadron, where you lads could feature in future videos yourselves. Once again, I really thank you for stopping by today. This video has been a very big project that I've been promising you lads for a long time, and I thank you for bearing with me, even though it is out two days later than I said it would be. Thank you so much for watching, lads, and until the next time, always remember, keep your bagpipes close at hand, keep your kilt firmly on, and I shall see you lads next video. I say a wee thank you to these lads for supporting me on Patreon. S Eagle Nuts, DA261, Latvian Wolf, Kiesley Gadarsen, and Dark Recon. You lads are bra. If you wish to join them, come check out the link in the description below.